Hello friends and welcome to the season 27 recap video for Building a Nation with Treaty United. Of course the save that is done over on Twitch. Well of course doing the transfer window over there right now so do hop over and have some fun with us. We've actually got um, some quite interesting players to look at this time because I was a bit late when setting up some of the scouting stuff so there's some potential guys that we've already assessed that we haven't gone for yet that we'll definitely be heading out for this time around. Of course if you want to drop a like on the video that would be very very helpful. Let's people know uh, well that the videos are good I suppose and also lets YouTube know that uh, well, other people can find them. And of course, if you want to watch the VODs in their entirety, they are, of course, over on the second channel, linked down in the description. And without any further ado, let's jump into things today with what happened in this year's Youth Intake. Yeah, it was crap again. I say crap again. It, it wasn't awful. Uh, no, it, it was. It was pretty piss poor, honestly. The best player we got was uh, Danny Bonk, who I'll be honest with you, we only signed him up really because his name is Danny Bonk. <laughs> that is his actual name, uh, which is delightful. We had a goalkeeper as well called Marla, but once we actually got the two guys in, he was the better of the two. He's, he's not a bad striker, honestly. He's got good finishing, good composure. He's actually quite fast. Well, good acceleration anyway. Never going to play for us in a million years. Might be useful for someone else. Obviously, part German, part Irish as well. He's not good, but we've come to expect nothing more, nothing less from our youth intakes these days. And uh, yeah, we kind of got the standard stuff. We got our Icelandic lad last year, and I think he's probably going to be the best player we get for the rest of the save, let's be honest. But that's, that's enough about that. Let's look at some ins and outs and signings and whatnot. And I feel like it's been a little bit more condensed this year as the money situation, because we've got such a huge loan farm now and some of them run quite high wages, we have actually had to start being a bit more careful about the way we're assigning players. Players. So we're not signing quite as many guys because it just costs lots of money and the club's wage bill is now to the point where we're not able to meet that demand with the uh, <laughs> income from other things currently without selling loads of players. Although I do suspect there'll still be some more sales this year, but let's jump in. The biggest sale, I think, actually, is Kaida Cisse. Uh, the youngster, I say youngster, is 24 now, that we'd had for a little while that we bought in from Diambars. After his, uh, well, one loan spell with Shamrock Rovers didn't work out too well for him there. He then refused to go out on loan again. And then Dortmund said, hey, how about £13 million plus a 50% of next selfie? And I said, yeah, I'll probably take that. So these are the kind of deals that we continue to do to just sort of keep the club afloat at the moment and i think it works for us we've got a lot of clauses that i'm hoping are going to sort of uh i don't know come good at some point too so that should hopefully earn us at least another 50 million at some point just all the clauses we've got put out there but yeah unai alonso has also left the club basically dundalk refused to extend his loan for another season uh, after 11 years there on loan he kind of finally fell out of favor and he came back and we decided in the end that actually the best course of action for unai alonso was to leave the club permanently so a million pounds was the deal over to la galaxy I mean, He's a good player. The fact that he had spent such a long time on loan at Dundalk is insane, but you can see how it really started to tail off in the last season and a half kind of thing. And eventually, he was just unable. And most of this was substitute appearances. I know, wow, he just wasn't playing very well, was he? I can see why they wanted him, but he's done well in the USA. Another big sale was Khan Yildiz. Uh, only £4.6 million was the deal to Chelsea. Basically, he was the guy that we dumped £13 million on from Fenerbahce, and we have to stop making transfers like that. They are just not going to help us. Um, and in the end, we just knew that he was never going to get a loan, never going to really end up playing in our first team so selling it for four million pounds to chelsea with a 50 percent of next sale fee clause again there's more of these clauses knocking about that hopefully we can cash in sooner rather than later to help us stay afloat at the moment because we have been ffp worried in the last couple of seasons hopefully that won't be so bad in the few years once the trofinovic money's gone out but still yeah he's gone as well for 4.6 million then yol rukovina went to dundalk for 1.1 million pounds it was more a case of they wanted him so i sold him to them because i'm always doing that with any irish side if they want a player i will sell them as cheap as possible. This was just what they offered and it was non-negotiable. Then there was Hygen Wan, who's gone out on loan, sorry, not on loan, permanently to Sligo Rovers for £155,000. Again, they offered more, but I just took out the initial fee and the rest is just clauses. So nice to see him finally have a permanent side, although he didn't actually play for them that much this season. Then there was youngster Victor Christian, who went to Dundalk for like 70 grand, basically. He's a good player, but again, just getting these guys out to other Irish sides is helpful. Then there was another situation like this. Niels Jensen's gone out on, sorry, on a permanent transfer to Derry City for half a million pounds. I would have given him to them for less, but they, it was non-negotiable. So I was like, well, you know, if you want the player, you can have him. Wasn't going to turn that down. But that now does conclude the out. So you can see there wasn't really that many. And I think there's going to be a few players like Navio, I suspect will be leaving us in the next uh, stream because he definitely is in the last year of his contract. We've got players coming through that I want to bring into the side. And I think now's a good time to cash in. I think the biggest issue we've got in terms of selling players at this team is that we just just cannot get good value for our sales because the club's squad value is still so low despite us being one of the best we're the second best side in europe like 
at the moment in terms of coefficient and everything. We are number two to only Chelsea, and yet our squad values are still so dismal after that one random bump. And unfortunately, it makes it very difficult for us to sell any players for good money. And it's a real shame that that's really hurting the save, and there's nothing we can do about it. But the first in was Nikola Kadic, 2.9 million pounds from FK Partizan. Solid enough player. He's okay. We'll get him out on loan. He's not on huge money either, so we wanted to take a punt. Then there was Mitchell Schmidt on a free transfer from Vivevenlo over in the Netherlands. He's been on loan at Drogheda this season and has banged 17 goals for them as they were promoted to the top flight again. Then, of course, there was Victor Christian, the guy that we sold to Dundalk. He cost 2.4 million pounds and we just gave him to them for like 90 grand, but you know, it's occasionally fine doing that. Then there was the 2.6 million pounds we dropped on Dejan Petrovic from uh, Tukaricki. He's gone on loan to some hats, so at least he's gone on loan to someone and is actually doing stuff there and playing matches. Then we spent 200,000 pounds on Jack Black. Uh, not because he's good, but because he's called Jack Black. Uh, so as long as he doesn't get sticky to the man the osis, I think we'll be fine. And he's actually gone out on loan with Bray Wanderers in the second tier. So you know what? He's, he's playing games. Then there's Kenneth Larson, £500,000 from Orbay. Bay. He's out on loan at St. Pats. You know, it's a lot of guys have gone on loan to St. Pats, and that has had an effect this season. Then there was £3 million we dropped on Joachim Aga. Now, the hope is that we can probably... I mean, he's wanted by some big sides, so he might be the type of player that we potentially just ship on straight away and then dump a clause in for the later down the line type of money, if we can. Then there, of course, was Niels Jensen, who I just showed you. £1.8 million he cost us from uh, Midland. We obviously took a loss on him to give him to Derry, but that's fine. Then there was one of the better signs, I think. This is Leonel Sierra. 4.6 million pounds he was from River Plate, but you can see that he has maintained some serious value, and he's even found himself a nice loan out to Shamrock Rover. So I think he's a really, really good player, and for 4.6 million, I think he was a genuinely good buy for us. So I'm happy for him, and happy that he's got himself a loan spell this season, and has got lots of games under his belt too. Then there was 2.6 million spent on Paul Oakley from Manchester United. He's also got a loan to some Pats, but again, the value gains on him is at least really, really good as well. So he's just a solid player, really good winger. Our aim was obviously to retrain him and play a little bit deeper, but now that he's on loan at some Pats, that's fine. They can do with him what they will. Then there was quite a huge signing of Leotinho, um, which was eight and a half million. And him, I regret the price on. It's still gained on here, and he is actually still wanted by Man United. So if we could move him on for insane money to someone like United, that could actually be very, very profitable for us down the line, especially if we can sneak in a 50% clause perhaps on the end of it. But yeah, eight and a half million for him was a lot, though you can see why we were interested in the first place. Then the biggest transfer of them all. Uh, this is Ivan Sedeno. Uh, he's probably going to be the last ever big transfer buy. Uh, in total, it's 20 million, but it's actually only 10 it's just backed up in loads and loads and loads of clauses and whatnot the main reason we wanted him is because he was a cuban and we don't see cubans be really really good very often he's got 34 caps at the age of 20 um now the thing is he's on lot at malaga and his value has actually doubled since we bought him so he's a potential player that even if we only have him for a little bit despite his sort of poor star rating i still think this guy's a really good footballer and if we could move him on for like 40 million pounds that would be some great business for us i just thought you know when you see a cuban player you want to go after them it's just kind of cool then there was seven hundred seventy-five thousand pounds for jose barnal of Millionaros, who's, you know, a good side, right-sided player. I think, you know, for the money we paid, he's a pr pretty reasonable deal, and hopefully we can find him alone or just sell him on to someone. Then there's Mark, who costs nothing. He was released by Barcelona, and we picked him up for free, and he's worth between 13 and 20 million pounds. He's another sort of shoal type situation. We're really trying to harvest a few players. And harvest, that's a really aggressive word. But hopefully trying to find some of these guys every single year, and we did it again with Mark. And I think these are how we're going to be able to make a lot of money off of some players. And he actually did play some games for us this season, despite that. He's not bad either. He's a solid centre-back, but if we could move him on for huge money, that would be such a good deal for us. And in that same breath, there was also Diego Stubbs, who we got on a free transfer from Manchester City. Not quite the same level of effectiveness, but... Look at that. He's just... Where do you play? I play in the middle uh, because apparently he can just play everywhere from centre-back to striker all the way through as well. Uh, he's also going to loan to some pass. And last but not least, Andre Lischka come in for £42,000. Gone out on loan to Waterford. Just another sale for that side of things. So you can see that there was a little bit less money spent than perhaps normal. A lot of it was spent on like two guys. And then there was a little bit less out than normal, but that will definitely change. I think next year there's going to be a lot more sales. Um, but we still can't boost that squad value and... I don't really know what to do at this point about it because it seems like it's completely broken. We had that one six-month period of having players be worth what they were actually worth when we got to that Champions League final a few years ago. Um, and before anyone says it's about the league rep, if that was the case, our league rep has only gone up since then. So it's very bizarre that we had that six-month period where our players actually had proper value. But yeah, and obviously we've been in the Champions League final and won it, as you know, last season since then. So it's just bizarre that we just refuse, the game refuses to let our players be valued at the correct values for them where we are in the world now. And that's really hurting us. 
us in terms of being able to negotiate good deals for our players when we sell them to other sides. But yeah, we've been fighting a lot of battles in this save, just fighting against the game mostly. And I think we've done pretty well to get to where we are, honestly, given the amount of things that have been broken. But that's just life. Hopefully that won't be the case in FM23. Hopefully we'll start the save a little bit later and then we won't have these issues, but you never know. I mean, the loan farm actually moved up to 92 players this season. It actually got bigger, despite the fact that we were trying to cut it down a little bit. Um, now I'm accepting any loans as always, but if players are not playing, I'm now recalling them. So you'll notice that almost all the players that we've got out on loan have got a decent amount of appearances under their belt. There's only a couple here that haven't, and they've only just moved out on loan. So a few of these guys, like... Um in fact, almost all of these guys are relatively fresh loans, so that's okay. And some of these guys are brand new loans that wouldn't have obviously had a chance to play yet. So it's when the guys aren't playing that I'm recalling them, trying to send them out to other sides. And it's encouraging other RSIs to spend some money on other players too. So they have spent money. Uh, we've seen big bids from like Dundalk, who spent 10 million on a guy from um, Livingston. There's big money coming in. We still have a decent amount of potential in this as well. And you'll notice as well that some of the better guys in here, like Obradovic at Dundalk, I mean, look at the state of this player. He's outrageously good. And Rigel, these guys shouldn't look at his value. This right here shows you how broken it is. Bear in mind, his contract doesn't expire until 2051. So it's not about contract length. He's got 50 caps for the Czech Republic, and the game has valued him at £750,000. Look at the state of this player. How is that? Which means that if a club wants to bid on him, that's the sort of money we'd expect to get, which is just ridiculous. <laughs> it's just insane. But then on the other hand, we've got Aaron Scholl here, who's worth £35 million. Again, he should be worth way more than that too, but it's just kind of mad. He has four German caps, by the way, while playing for Shamrock Rovers, which is just astonishing. He's another of the freebies we picked up a few years ago. I like to show him repeatedly because he's just so good. But we are going to have to sort of take a look at that, but I don't really know what much we can do about it. Point is, the loan farm is going very, very nicely indeed. Top scorer this year was Dino Yedva with 29 goals, but Ashanu 26 seven of Bradovich with 27 as well Daniel Antonio with a nice 26 goal haul there Dimitrov with 23 Lane with 23 he's not even a striker he's a midfielder he's got 14 assists and 21 goals this season don't know who the top assister was uh it was Vukotic actually of course with 18 there just lovely to see these guys being so incredibly fruitful during their loan spells and it's exciting to see what these guys are capable of got some other guys that will probably get loans too which is exciting All right. as for the league well you can guess what happened yes of course we won it uh, with an insanely high points total as we do every single year the big thing of interest this year was that both Bose and Shamrock fell out of contention for the Champions League. Shamrock had a genuinely bad season and finished miles clear of it and I don't really know why. Their squad is very very good so I don't know what's up with that one. Sligo back in the Champions League for next year along with Dundalk and Derry. Derry of course going to do their second season in the Champions League now. Uh, Bose as a European contender they're a weird one. Like they're a good side clearly but they've been a bit of a weird kettle of fish as far as Europe is concerned. Watford are relegated. You'll notice though, Longford Town survived. The tycoon side finally survive a season in the top flight and I'm hoping that might be the start of something massive for them if they actually start buying players a bit more regularly now. Maybe take some loans. I think we could build them into that seventh team because at the moment this year's seventh side in Europe is going to be St. Pat's who conceded over 100 league goals this season and finished the season with minus 67 goal difference. <laughs> They're going to be our uh, Europa Conference League team next season. But to be fair, they can't do any worse than Cork City. So I'm actually okay with that. You'll also see that Valev, 42 league goals this year. He now broke the record that was set last year by Christensen with 42 in the league. And uh, Trubovic as well with 28 assists, which is utterly stupefying. Lane, though, with 11 man of the match awards is still very, uh, very, very impressive indeed. Just an all-round good season, as you'd expect. As for the second flight, draw had a fairly comfortable winners of that. Bray did get to the playoff final, but were demolished 5-0 by Longford, which is what we want to see, honestly. Just keeping Longford in the top flight for a bit until they can establish themselves, that's the dream. But we won all the domestic trophies, as you would expect for a to do. So I suppose your question now turns to what happened to us in Europe last season? Given that we'd won the Champions League before, we were feeling confident, confident? Confident about our chances this season. Uh, just one thing actually before on that. You can see that our, despite all the success we've had in Europe, our league's reputation, and with the other Irish sides being successful too, has remained stagnant in seventh spot, despite us being sitting third in the coefficients. Um, maybe that's got something to do with the fact that our players' values haven't changed, but it still wouldn't explain that one season when they did. So I guess we'll just have to wait and see on that one as to why on earth we're still not moving up on the reputation. <laughs> but it is what it is. Now for us in Europe. Of course we had Juventus, went away and managed to grab ourselves a lovely cheeky victory away from home in Italy, which was very, very good because two goals for Thais Freeze, one for Stefan Valev, exactly what we needed. A win in the away leg gave us a really good chance in the home game. And boy, did we take that chance with open arms. A 5-1 thrashing of them at the Dara Galvin just propelled us comfortably through to the next round of the Champions League. I mean, it was all in the first half as well. We scored five goals in the first half, just demolished them and then just took a foot off the gas. 8-3 victory in the end. Very, very comfortable. Uh, both Christensen and Valev grabbing braces in this game. Just what you want to see. And then things got even better for us in the quarterfinals. A 3-0 thrashing of Manchester City in the first game gave us a really comfortable lead to take back to England. Uh, it was just really, really nice indeed. 
One for, two for Christmas and one for Valor. Standard story. Second leg, though, can always be a bit of a problem, as we found out last time we played City. And boy, did it prove to be that yet again. They were two goals up inside 20 minutes. Luckily, Christensen's goal in the 26th minute uh, allowed Ali Nogbu's goal not to matter too much. But again, it was a very even game. We were very, very unlucky to lose this match on the night, honestly. And you know how that can often be the case in Europe for us. We just have too many of those. Luckily, we were through to the semi-finals with this result. 4-3 on aggregate. Back-to-back -back chances to get the semis. We placed Real Madrid in the semi-finals as Chelsea had already been knocked out. We thought this was a great great chance for us to go all the way. First leg at the Bernabeu didn't exactly do brilliantly. We were definitely the better side by a comfortable margin and should have probably won the match. Uh, Real Madrid were terrible in this game, especially Raf Voss. But unfortunately, Mustafa just kept them in the match in this one. We definitely should have won this game. Very, very disappointing not to get the result. But, you know, we thought a 0-0 draw away from home. Playing that well, we're always better at home. This is surely our big chance to get to our second consecutive Champions League final. And then this happened. Um, Raf Voss in the 34th minute gave Real Madrid the lead at the Dara Galvin after a mistake where the ball was just played directly to him in complete space for no reason, scored. It took until the 91st minute for Daniel Bilbia to bail us out of this one after we'd battered them for the rest of the match. And that was enough to see it go to extra time. And then penalties, where we then lost on penalties. After being comfortably the better side in both legs in this, somehow we didn't manage to get the result that we needed. And as a result, went out on penalties after getting through on penalties to the final last season. And Real Madrid then went on to win the Champions League. And I, I think that if we beat Real Madrid, we'd have had a great chance at back-to-back -back Champions Leagues because we were definitely the better side over both games. And especially in this one. Like... <sighs> I think we could have won the second, the first leg 1-0, and I think this one could have easily been a 3-1 victory. I think, honestly, a 4-1 on aggregate would have been much fairer, but when has that ever mattered to us? It just feels like we, as I've said in previous seasons, it feels like we have so many matches where we're the best side and we don't get the result versus the other way around when it is so rare that we're the worst side and we get the result. And it's just an unfortunate scenario for us, and that's what we've been fighting against. But still, back-to-back semi-final appearances and very, very close to back-to-back -back final appearances. And I know that we would have won it. I, I feel like we would have definitely had it in us. We were just so good throughout that period in terms of creativity. Valve and Christensen were a different class. It's just a real shame to have it go that way, but there you go. As for the other Irish sides in Europe, we actually had a very good collection of them this time around. Four of them, of course, in the Europa League knockouts. Didn't go ideally there, but still went pretty well. Lille put to the sword 6-2 by Sligo Rovers, which was great. Dundalk lost the first leg against Onetian, but did turn it around to progress. And then Shamrock Rovers putting a comfortable 4-0 thrashing down on Sparta Prague, see them progress as well. Bose unfortunately lost 6-3 on aggregate to Atletico after going down 3-0 in the home game. That 3 all draw was away. I know it doesn't look like it here, but it was. It was at the Wanda Metropolitano, but they did drop out at that point. But having three sides go through to the second round was very good for us. Unfortunately, in the second round, we did lose another one as Shamrock Rovers were beaten 3-0 on aggregate by RB Leipzig. However, it didn't matter though, as Sligo were able to beat Leon 4-3 and Dundalk comfortably dispatched Hearts 4-1 and reached the quarter-final stage. Unfortunately, it was at that point that we lost both of them. Uh, Sligo Rovers eventually going out 3-1 to Manchester United after drawing at Old Trafford, if I recall. It was so unfortunate as well, but there you go. And then Dundalk going out 3-2 against Valencia at the quarter finals it could have been so so different um, unfortunately it just wasn't quite there they're still competing which is good but oh it could have been so much better for us as for the conference league Derry City beat PSV Eindhoven very very well not very comfortably but comfortably enough to get through to the next round where they then matched up against Deportivo Alaves and were able to progress one round further to go to the quarterfinals this year after a 4-3 victory unfortunately it was the quarterfinal stage where things went horribly wrong for them so in the first leg against Slavia Prague. They won 2-1. Slavia Prague had one shot in the entire game, if I recall, and Derry City had about an XG of like three and a half and should have smashed them. And unfortunately, in the second leg, it went exactly as you expect it to when that happens, and Slavia Prague were able to destroy Derry City, and I would say very unfairly knock them out, but it is what it is. Uh, Derry City should have won that first leg about 4-0. But that's life, isn't it? Um, and that's just how it went. And Slavia Prague did end up going all the way to the final as well, which just shows you how Derry City could have been the team to go all the way to the final. West Ham were the eventual winners, I believe. And that, of course, brings us on to Europe for this season. Now, of course, we had four Irish sides in the Champions League group stages. Again, let's see how they got on. Well, let's see how we got on first. We'd managed to win our Champions League group, which was very, very nice indeed. I mean, when we got Chelsea in there, I was a little bit worried, but Chelsea do not look like the same side they were um, a couple of seasons ago when we beat them in very, un very fortunately in the playoff uh, Champions League final. 6-0 victory against Red Bull Salts standard sort of stuff in there too and uh, we beat Chelsea 4-0 at the Dara Galvin with a hat trick from Christensen, which was delightful. We lost 2-4-2 to Chelsea. This game was never a 4-2 in a million years, but it is what it is. Luckily, Valad's late goal ensured that we'd have the head-to-head -head advantage. Not that it mattered, though, as Chelsea were able to get themselves a cheeky little draw against Villarreal and thus gave us the group win. On the final day, both us and Chelsea won 7-1, um, but it wasn't enough, and we were able to win the group with 24 goals being scored too, which is just delightful. So we get through to the next round, and would you believe it, we're playing Juventus again, just like last year. So if we get the same results, we should be in a good spot to get through to the quarters. Mary City found themselves in their first Champions League group, came into Group D, and there was a brief chance for them. They managed to win at Marseille, 
and I thought there was hope for them there, but unfortunately it was not to be the case as in the end they did end up. But basically the biggest issue was that Marseille lost, oh, sorry, they beat Barcelona and who else did they beat? They beat someone else as well. Yeah, they beat Man United and Barcelona and that was enough for them to cling on and comfortably get that third spot. There was a chance for Derry City, but it just was not to be in the end. So they end up going out of Europe entirely and only get the one win in there, but it was something I suppose. Better news though for Dundalk, who for the third time in this save progress out of their Champions League group. We were really hoping that they would get third and play in the, uh, the Europa League after Christmas, but nope, they just had to go one better than that. They always seem to get one outrageous victory. They were two times they were ahead at the Etihad as well. They then went and beat Atletico Madrid as well after that. One away at Sparta Prague, obviously. Uh, sorry, Slavia Prague home and away. And then got a 4-1 thrashing at home in Manchester City, but then took a, you know, a one-all draw away against Atletico as well. And that was enough for them to sneak through in second spot with 10 points. So for the third, con well, not third consecutive, but for the third time in the save, Dundalk will be in the knockouts. So I guess there's that. It's helpful, but it also means that we're going to have, they're going to go out in the first round, aren't they? I can't remember who they're playing, but it's someone huge. I think it's Bayern. But finally, some good news is that Shamrock Rovers were able to get themselves through in third spot in their group. So they're going to be in the Europa League knockouts after Christmas. They beat PSV Eindhoven home and away, and then lost all four other matches but they had some close ties in a few games did only concede eight goals across the group which is very very impressive for them considering being up against Inter and Liverpool they were all quite minor defeats for the most part like two ones here two nils there nothing major and being able to get good results against PSV allowed them to get third and they will be in the knockouts of the Europa League after Christmas as for the Europa League it wasn't quite as successful for us although what I would say is Sligo Rovers winning five out of six of their games they're a Champions League side and having them in the Europa League this year was a godsend because it meant they got a really good chance at a decent run winning their group going to the second round straight off the bat i think they've got a real shot at a deep run this year so that's exciting for them i suppose what was less exciting is at the bottom here bohemian they got a really tough group with hibs real sociedad and fenerbahce and only managed to get two points in the entire group dreadful performance from them in europe the last couple of seasons honestly and it didn't change this time around unfortunately but you can see in that first knockout round basel are shamrock rovers opponents so i think they've got a good chance at progressing at least to the second knockout round if nothing else and see what they can get from the draw after that unfortunately when it comes to the conference league cork city are just not cut out for this they're just about good enough to get to the group stages of these things but once they're there they i mean they couldn't even beat dinamo tbilisi they actually lost to them and that's the sort of level that cork city are operating on i'm hoping now that St. pats are going to be our representatives next year they've got a lot more players from us i think they can strengthen and i think they'll be a lot better of a team despite their horrendous league form in places i think they'll have a much better chance of competing in europe than cork city well if they can just get there which i think they're actually better than them so they should do fairly comfortably so not too much to write home about there it's us and dundalk in the champions league knockouts and it's shamrock rovers and a uh, Sligo Rovers in the Europa League knockout. So not quite the same numbers that we had last year, unfortunately. And as a result, that is going to cost us. Because we are on nine points this season, but the issue is around us, other teams like Italy, 13-point season. It's just unfortunate, really. We're still ranked like sixth for the year, despite that. It's just tough when you just can't get them to perform. And unfortunately, as things stand at the moment, barring a miracle, we're probably going to lose our top four status this year with Italy having the season of their lives. It's going to be very, very difficult for us to claw that gap back to them over there. I mean, it's still not much. It's only a 0 0.3 gap, but that's going to require some miracles from us against the other Italian sides and them to go out very, very early in all the competitions they're in. So I think we are going to lose our top four status this year, which might not be the end of the world. It could actually be a blessing in disguise in that it would allow... Less teams in Europe, obviously, but it would mean that then the good teams would be the ones in Europe, so it wouldn't be diluted so much by the bad ones, and thus also it would allow some of the slightly better ones to drop into worse competitions and maybe have a couple of another chance at a sort of seventeen point nine season, which we're going to bloody need because obviously next year we're going to be down to quite a good season. We're losing quite a bad season, so we have a chance there, but we need another big season before we lose that seventeen point nine. Otherwise, I just don't think we're going to be able to go anywhere. But you never know. You, you just never know with these guys. We have already managed to win. European trophies. We've won all of them now, so we've got Europa League and Champions League, and Shamrock have the Conference League. I still think there's a chance that an Irish side is going to win another trophy in this save, because we don't have that many more seasons to go, I wouldn't have thought. But still, I just, I'm holding out hope. I think we have to take a step back to take a step forward in a couple of seasons, hopefully. But that's the situation as things are right now. We just don't have that seventh side that's strong enough to really compete, and I'm hoping it could be Longford. Maybe. Maybe that's what we need. Drop out, not have that seventh side for a season or two, and then just come back with Longford being that side, and then maybe things will be different. It's just, it's so, so difficult at this stage with all the other things that are balked and broken about the save. So obviously Christensen has had an outrageous season. 45 goals in the, or no, 45 goals in 37 matches is still insane. But look, just 
what is that valuation on this player here? It just is obscene. But he's had a great year. Not as good as last year. Valve has really been the standout player for us this year, and you'll see why in a minute. But yeah, Christensen has still been fantastic. Valve, on the other hand, has been obscene. Uh, it says 67, but it's not actually 67. It's 71 goals. 71 goals Stefan Valve has scored for us this season. Still, yeah, it's worth £30 million, pounds, obviously, uh, after scoring 71 goals this season. But yeah, if he doesn't win the Ballon d'Or, I'm going to be absolutely bloody livid. For once, I actually haven't progressed and got us to January, so I don't know what happens coming up soon. But yeah, Valve has just been a monster this year. To score 71 times in all competitions is a different level of quality, and I don't think that will ever be matched in this save. He becomes the first player since Emmett Doran to get those kind of numbers, and it's a long, long time since Emmett Doran did that, over 20 years. So the fact that Valve's come up and done that and broke that almost unassailable record is incredibly impressive. Octavio Menea still smashing stuff in for us. 18 goals, 18 assists this season. Genuinely excellent performance from him this year. Nearly 100 caps from Romania as well, and obviously will always be remembered as the guy that scored the winning goal in the Champions League. Angelo Trujubovic obviously is still brilliant. Um, um, 21 years old, still worth less money than we pay for him, of course, because reasons. Um, he's five star, five star in this team now. 24 caps for Croatia. He got 19 goals and 41. It's not 41, is it? That's wrong again, isn't it? Uh, yeah, 20 goals and 43 assists this season in all competitions for him ludicrous performance to, to contribute to what was that 63 goals this year which obviously Valve still computed like 80 odd but still that's insane then we still have the legend that is thighs freeze 35 years old now is thighs freeze still has one year left on his deal and he's still hanging on in there as an absolute legend of this team i think really he has to be the favorite to be the manager for the next save at this point uh this is he still contributed 18 goals in 18 starts at the age of 35 in the midfield he is just a boss and if I could extend him another season, I would genuinely would want to do that because he deserves to keep playing. He's got great natural fitness and he's just been able to stay up with everything. What a guy. Up until the midpoint in this season, he was still like three and a half star rated. Then, of course, we've got Dorian Niakshu, uh, probably the best, one of the best left wing backs in the world at this point, to be fair. He's just insanely good. Uh, ignoring that, of course. Highest paid player at the club as well on £110,000 a week. Still only 27 years old as well. 20 assists from him this year. He's just a rock, just a god of a player, um, considering how much we paid for him. But he's the one. At one point, he was worth 128 million in this team, and yet this is what he's worth now. That's just obscene. Bogdanov at right wing back, of course, with 24 assists. He's now become like a four and a half star player for us as well. He's just ludicrously good in that role of just creating chances for people. And what a season he's had. Still has the off game here and then, but he's just fantastic. Love him. Still only 24 as well. Then obviously we have probably the best player at the entire club now, Gilberto Neslo, 23 year old Dutch centre back. I would say he's probably one of the best centre backs in the world already, and he's 23 years old, worth 40 million lol. But yeah, six foot six, just an absolute destructo device of a centre back. He is just one of my favourite players ever, and he is a true gentleman. The moment we knew he was coming into this team, we were like, this guy's going to be something, and here he is, five star, five star. Then there is Luis Navio, 31 years old, his contract's up at the end of next season. He is the type of player that I'm probably going to move on this January, if we can, for some quite large money with some clauses in there too, ideally. Um, considering he's a guy we paid a million pounds for from Porto, how about eight years ago, and he's just become an absolute stalwart in this team. But I feel like he needs to move on to allow space for someone else to come through this team because he's just an absolute gent. But love him, but I think he probably will leave us this window. And of course, there is Pedrag Lukacic on the left-hand side of that. And again, he's just another absolute monster. 24-year-old Croatian. Again, stunningly good defenders we've got with Neslo and Lukacic. And I feel like the key thing is with, with Navio leaving, it will leave room then for Hamza Saki to complete the trio of absolute monstrous centre-backs. And that's what we've been looking for. And I think that's what takes us to the next level. Navio is brilliant, but he still doesn't have that aerial level whereas if we get saki lukacic and neslo we'd have six foot five six foot six six foot six and they'd also be good as well and quick and of course in goal duje mikulic has still played quite a lot this season so the one area of this team i think still lets us down a little bit is that despite the attributes i still think we need a world-class goalkeeper and we've just really not been able to have one since Mihov in places, but honestly, since Bart for Bruggen, we haven't had that goalkeeper that I'm like, yes. Other notable mentions, of course, go to Umbe Sao, still knocking about, doing brilliantly for us. Hasn't played, oh, he's still played 26 games this, or 28 games from the start this season, just maybe a few less in certain areas because he's been deployed across the entire team, but he's still an absolutely brilliant player. Considering he costs us like, what, 15 grand? Then we've got Daniel Bilbia, who genuinely is becoming an insane striker. Uh, he got 18 goals this season, only started 18 games. He is genuinely phenomenal as a backup striker. And the fact that he's still knocking around as a backup player is, is obscene, but we actually need to keep him here because the fact is now he can pretty much play on both sides of our strike force too, which is just incredibly useful to have. Obviously, we've got the backup on the left side, Dragan Radojic, who's still... I love that he's our backup left wing back. Look at the state of him as a backup. 77 grand a week as a fringe player, but he's happy to be here. Then there's Eric Halskin, 
Ironically, a guy who was on loan at Sligo Rovers for a couple of seasons and was brilliant there broke his leg, and as a result, they refused, or is it his ankle? They refused to extend his loan, so I brought him back in. This season, 17 goals and 12 assists for Eric Halskin playing in that attacking midfield role for us, and mostly in like rotation option sides, but he's genuinely been fantastic, so big up Eric. Just goes to show that some of the loan guys, if they do come back and perform, can still find a way into their team. Then there's Andres Trotter, basically our backup striker for the most part. 18 goals for Andres this season, still a very, very good player. A lot of room to improve into the future, I would say, though. There is, of course, Hamza Saki, uh, the player I'm making room for by moving on Luis Navio, because I feel like Saki is going to be like Navio, but just so much better. And he's managed to develop to where he is without really having consistent games. He's still played 24 times this year, which is the most I think he's ever played in a season, but he's still never been like a first choice centre back that's expected to play 40 games a season. I think once he does, he's going to take that step up and be just as good as Lukacic and uh, Neslo and have a, a, the three best centre backs in the world potentially in this treaty side. <laughs> we can't forget, of course, about Alexander Lindbergh, still at the club, only started four matches for us this year, and I feel like he's another guy that could potentially move on because I just don't know if he's ever going to be able to get back into this team anymore with the likes of Ramos and Madrid coming through. And then there's Mihai Alaku, 36-year-old Mihai Alaku, club captain. He will be leaving, I think, in this window uh, and probably will retire at that point too. He's still playing games for Romania at 36, which is insanely impressive, but he has finally sort of declined to the point where he just didn't feature at all for us this season. But what a captain he's been. Then, of course, we have the likes of Fidel Madrid, who is one of the guys that's probably going to take over that midfield role in a few seasons because he is just, I think he's got mad potential. But that pretty much sums up where we find ourselves at this point in time. I'll just show you the squad sort of setup as well, so you can just sort of see the, the goal scoring and whatnot, with the fact that Valve got 71, 50 for Christie, just insane. 43 assists in there too. It's just a very, very stacked team. There's also some very good personalities in this team now. I'm noticing that. Like, lots of resolute model professional, model citizens. A lot of the strongest players in the squad have got those personalities, and it really, really shows just how good those guys could potentially be as well. So, yes, of course, join us over on stream right now. We'll be doing the transfer window, trying to strengthen the sort of wheel and deal, trying to make some money in this window, ideally, uh, because as much as we have a huge budget, finances at the moment aren't actually all that good. We're down to 115 million, still rich, which is good, but we need to get in some we need to get some balance in, basically. You can see that we've genuinely been sort of shrinking off in terms of money in the bank for quite a few seasons now, and we definitely need to rectify that issue for us at the moment, because we are kind of losing money hand over fist at the moment. <laughs> you can see we lost 53 million this season. So that's something that definitely is going to have to change, because it's, uh, yeah, it's kind of poor for us. We need to really sort that out. So it could be a lot of sales, but unfortunately, these sort of things don't really matter unless we can get good money for our players, which we can't, and that's the biggest issue we find ourselves in. So, yeah, word of the day, word of the day, word of the day. Okay, we're going to do Ooh, what's the word of the day? Custard cream. I have my standard trusty bedside custard creams, as I'm sure you all do. Um, use that in the comments if you can, and drop it in chat, and I'll definitely be very confused. I've just noticed our finances are okay. That will be fine. That seems to do that for like three weeks before every single season now, and then it switches back. So that should be okay, hopefully. But yeah, if you have enjoyed this, and I hope you have, drop a like. That'd be sick. If you're new to the channel, subscribe. That'd be gorgeous too. I stream on Twitch. You know all about that. Go follow over there too if you already haven't. And join me over there right now because we are live doing some transfer window goodies. And I'll see you guys very, very soon for the season 28 recap where hopefully it's good news. Hopefully. I'll see you guys soon. Hold your gun. Capybara. Bye-bye.